Hi, I'm Chris McDermott. And I'm Stuart McDermott. And we've been associated with Brattleboro Area Hospice since the uh, beginning days, which has been over 30 years. We really love being hospice volunteers and are involved in many aspects of uh, our hospice here in our community. One of the reasons that we love Brattleboro Area Hospice so much is because of the many services that they offer. The hospice client volunteers, there's the bereavement program, early care program, advanced directives, visual volunteers, shop volunteers, and finally being a member of the board of directors. The hospice organization, I think, is very, very important because we care about each other during very difficult times. And the hospice community is there. For me, it's very meaningful to be right next and knowing that people can care, even if I don't say much or anything. I can sit with and care for people. Another program that uh, we're involved in is being a bereavement volunteer. And so after the death of a person's family member or loved one or friend, they can call hospice and ask to be part of a bereavement support group or have a bereavement volunteer. That's a good thing for hospice. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to our Summer Garden Virtual Tour in Vermont. And a special thanks goes to Rita Ramirez and Tom Bodette who own this beautiful garden. And we'd also like to say thank you to Lori Merrigan and Helen O'Donnell who are their gardeners. And the four of them have put this tour together uh, as a fundraiser for Brattleboro Area Hospice. So we are so grateful to the four of them and to Mother Nature. <laughs>Hi, my name is Rita Ramirez and welcome to my garden. Today we're going to take you on a walking tour through the garden, point out some of the flowers that are really special to us. We've been working on this garden for eight years and uh, it's evolved and it's been a great labor of love. Welcome. This is the gravel garden, which at one time was all grass and we decided to turn it into something a little bit more, um, a little bit more interesting. Mm -hmm. So we took out all of the grass, pounded everything down, laid down the gravel, and then, uh, and then Helen just went at it. <laughs> well, I, I would just add that um, when we started this, this beautiful hydrangea here, quick fire, um, was one of the few things in the front of the house. And so we added four more hydrangea quick fires and they go kind of burgundy in the fall and that uh, reflects the colors of the house. So that's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had roses planted against the wall and that was that predates the gravel garden I think. It does. Predate. And then I came back from England and had been to Beth Chatto's garden and fell in love with the gravel gardening there and said to Rita, what about a gravel garden? And she went right online and researched it and got very excited and thought it was the most beautiful thing she said and saw, and there we go, we made a gravel garden. We made a gravel garden, and it is really beautiful. The basic principle for the gravel garden is we didn't add any compost or rich soil. We sort of have like a sandy loam in Dummerston, so it, it's a pretty good free-draining soil already. If it was a heavy clay soil, a gravel garden probably wouldn't work. So we didn't actually have to like amend the soil all that much <clears throat> with anything. Sometimes when you're building a gravel garden, you'd add a bunch of sand. So we just kept the existing soil, but added about six inches of, gra of this pea stone. And that actually act acts like a mulch, retains water, and creates a dry crown for all the different plants. So the plants that are growing in here really like dry crowns, free draining soil, hot sun. We water it. the roses, mm -hmm. but other than that, we don't water. So we have a lot of chartreuse green as Euphorbia stricta, golden foam which I'd never grown before, but I grew it in my greenhouse and I thought, oh, that could be a good gravel garden. It is a little weedy in the gravel garden, um, but you can see that it seeds freely, fills all the spaces and creates this like gorgeous chartreuse haze. Euphorbias do really well in here. We have <clears throat> Liatris and that one's Pycnostachus, Pycnostacca, and it's a, a native prairie plant. And often you see sort of Liatris um, uh, spica, spica, 
that's over, we have it in other places, it's much shorter. Mm -hmm. And this one is really tall. It's like five feet and kind of, um, it gets snaky kind of, and it has a nice purple blazing star. It's um, beautiful. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And that's starting to seed around too. So we're, um, the one thing about gravel gardening is that a lot of these, it's a great medium for seed germination. So a lot of things sort of freely seed and place themselves where they want to go. Euphorbias are showing up kind of everywhere. We have Donii and Oblongata as well as Stricta. So they're kind of all doing their thing in here. Um, the Liatris, we've got the um, Baby's Breath. It's uh, Pacifica, I'm not quite sure actually. And that's been very perennial and seeding around. And then we've got the Ladies Mantle, a nice Anthemis, the Perennial Foxglove. The cat mint, that was all here actually. Right, right. A lot of the things that are against the uh, the wall were here initially. And then we just, we added a lot more in and... Uh, that lovely sedum. Right, yeah, and, and, and filled it in. Centaurias are another sort of meadowy, dry, hot plant. Um, that's dilbata, Centauria dilbata. And um, allium, lots of bulbs do well mm -hmm. in here. Lots of bulbs mm -hmm. do well in here. There's also this really beautiful oregano. What is that one again, Helen? Um, a, um, um, rotundifolium, Paula's pink. So that's a beautiful, uh, it's not often perennial, but it's perennial in the gravel garden. So a lot of things that wouldn't be perennial in Vermont are perennial in this garden because they get the free draining soils. So much of the winter wet makes these plants die. Mm -hmm. But um, in this environment, uh, it keeps them drier and gets them through the winter easier. Lori was going to mention the dianthus because we also have a lot. That's another um, pinks, carnations, little um, perennial dianthus. This one at the front with the, um, the, the two pale pink flower, mm -hmm. that's sort of a typical dianthus that you'd see everywhere. Um, and we've added this Carthusinorum, which is like a very tall, you don't see this often. Um, and that is very happy in the gravel garden and reseeds around. And there's also a very sweet yellow one called Dianthus napii, yellow harmony. And that's over there in bloom. So sort of like a place to experiment with these um, dry, free dra they like the dry free draining soils, yeah. So some of the things that we want to point out here, I think, are this um, this one that to me looks like Scottish thistle, mm -hmm. but I'm I know it's a thistle, but I'm not sure what the Latin it's name is. Sturcium heterophylla. Never would have guessed it. Never would. Never would have guessed it. It's great. Uh, it's a it's a cool experimental plant. I got the seeds a few years ago and trialed it in Rita's garden, and then it's discovered it was quite beautiful and have collected seeds since and been able to grow it and sold them all. <laughs> because um, Helen is absolutely, we just decided that we're going to refer to Helen O'Donnell as the, as the plant witch, okay. in a good way. In a good way. In a yeah. good way. Okay. Yeah, she really has the magic touch and um, her ability to grow plants from seed and to experiment is remarkable. And you can see how absolutely but Rita successful lets, it is. But Rita lets me experiment. <laughs> Rita and Tom, they just say... And so Go I get to try it. lots of plants and discover how great they are here. But yeah, this is an absolutely gorgeous one. So, yeah. And then you were going to point out another plant up here. Oh, this Mahonia, um, just at EC Brown is a great nursery in Thetford. They should get lots of credit. They supply us with lots of plants. And they had this Mahonia, which is an Oregon native. Um, this one's Aquifolium. And uh, it's just, we're, I, I was so excited to find it. And they said it was hardy. So trying it here and it's made it through one winter. It made it through, and it turns really, it turns like a beautiful reddish color. Beautiful reddish color. And if it blooms, it'll have this sort of big panicle of yellow flowers. So, but this is a great um, environment to try certain things that you wouldn't think would make it otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing to mention are the roses. These, uh, we have four roses, two um, Gertrude Jekyll pink rose and two New Dawn, it's a climbing rose. And they've been in for quite a few years. Um, and always great when you have successful roses in Vermont. So that's been successful. And anything else? Oh, the scabiosa, the fama scabiosas are, have been making it through winters um, more and more, especially in this good hot spot. So that's exciting, mm -hmm. um, the fama 
type. I, that's got a cultivar name I don't remember. Um, these dutzias are also kind of important plants, I think, along the pathway. And they go, they have this beautiful white flower in the spring, and then they go totally burgundy. I think burgundy is a, a leaf color that repeats itself through the garden a lot, and it really sets off the house. And those do not get cut back in the fall. And they do not get cut learned. back in the fall. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Oh, Tennessee yeah. echinacea, beautiful. It's a great alternative to all the purpureas that you see everywhere that are very short-lived. This Tennessee echinacea um, is gorgeous and seems to be much more long-lived. And does it? What's the color of the flower? It's pink. One? It's a big pink oh, open, right. big pink open uh -huh. echinacea-like flower. Uh -huh. um, but its longevity and steadfastness has been, you know, admirable. admirable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you grow that in your? In I your... do. Yes. I collect seed from here too. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rita and Tom. Okay, so we're going to move on to the garden that's up here. This initially, well, this is where Helen and Lori started. This was the first area that the two of them worked on and, um, and like, you know, brought it all together. My memory of it is a little fuzzy, but I know that these three crab apples were here. This Fiza carpus was here with two others, the Russian sage, peonies and maybe some of the peonies were here but the gardens were not connected and that's when Helen and Lori worked their began to work their magic yeah yeah um, and so then I think we connected the garden the path wasn't here yet because Jared Flynn put that in when he did all the stonework that came later actually okay. so it was sort of just like an an egg shape, I'd say, or oh, something like right, that, or a right. kidney bean, maybe. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just decided to make a, a three-season garden, well, four-season garden. Mm -hmm. So adding the elements like the, the camisiferous, the evergreen over there, and um, the shrubs held their own. We eliminated some of the shrubs and moved them to other parts of the property because it was too much mm -hmm. of the physocarpus. You really only need one. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty big. And this is summer wine, a really, really nice cultivar that Sienna planted. Uh, that predated us when Sienna started the gardens. Um, Sienna McFarland, great gardener. And uh, so we decided to add, uh, just add more perennials and annual layers to get really a very dynamic garden starting from March till October. Mm -hmm. So you have tulips and bulbs in the early spring and then um, a succession of flowering perennials and annuals throughout the rest of the year. So by the end of the season, it's still in full bloom. And um, that was kind of our starting place. Um, some of the plants are gone, but the ones, because <laughs> it changes all the time. Um, but this Aurelia cordata sun king has been here through and through and just provides like amazing color and texture uh, throughout the season. Um, then the panicum heavy metal, that sort of is the grass that uh, anchors that garden in the fall. And there's a really nice hot pink aster. Um, right now we have the geranium, Orion geranium in bloom over there, and the garas are just beginning. Gara is a plant you see throughout the garden. Uh, we plant them periodically, but they mostly reseed or are perennial in this garden. Uh, it's a cultivar called the bride, which seems to be very hardy for us. And uh, that is a nice plant because it blooms the whole year and adds this just like creamy pinky white to the best. feathery texture and that yes. feathery texture mm -hmm. yeah this this grass predates us too this is the penicetum hamlin pretty sure that has a gorgeous um puffy <coughs> low bloom uh midsummer to winter so that's great all this bright gold uh sedum also was here originally as well as this chrysanthemum ground cover white bomb or something 
can't remember what it's called, but um, that's quite wonderful in the fall. And great now too, because it's a carpet of green. Mm -hmm. I would say too that this garden in the fall is particularly beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, just the, the change of the colors, the, uh, the, diff the varying heights, the, there's just there's a, a really spectacular look to this garden in the fall. And then we do load it up with annuals in here, and um, it's they're really just sort of beginning, but this <clears throat> Kufia Sriracha Rose is a total winner and seeds around. We have a lot of Cleome and Cosmos that come later. This beautiful Clarkia Burgundy wine, which I love, and um, the Diacea over here, this little sweet pink thing. Mm, so pretty. Helen, what's this one back here that's growing with the orangey? Oh, yeah. It's Onathera Versicolor Sunset Boulevard. And <laughs> we, uh, last year it was kind of a flop, but this year, I don't know, the season was just right. And we planted it in amongst the Russian sage and it's been is really that fabulous. Is an annual or is that a... Um, it's an, an annual. It's perennial if you live elsewhere, but right, for us but here it's, it's an, an annual. annual. Because I think some of that, like bringing that color a little bit closer, because you know I love, I love orange, right? Yep. So bringing that, I saw that and thought, oh, I, I want more of that. And last year it was at the front and it looked bad. So and it looked bad because it just didn't It just, it just didn't, didn't grow thrive. well or the huh. it could be the seed, it could have been the year, it could have been how it's grown. I, you know, I, all these mysteries about plants, right, like why right. it's having a stellar year everywhere. So. And it looks so beautiful mixed in with the Russian sage. Yeah. It does. Yeah. And the corn flowers coming. Uh, Jared Flynn, a uh, local stone mason and um, and really mm -hmm. a master, installed mm -hmm. these guard. The majority of the yeah. the garden walls and the stonework is done by him. Trying to remember how this I all know. started. The, mm -hmm. the sunroom was put on, and um, and we all went inside and we started kind of from the inside looking out and trying to decide where we wanted um, the views to be maintained, where we wanted privacy, uh, and and I re I remember Tom specifically was like, I want to see out to the meadow and I don't want to block it because my I think my tendency often is to just like plant big and. <laughs> create like I don't know why but but so I was like okay no shrubs in front so we'll keep it low and we'll connect it to the to the surrounding fields um, I th we did anchor with some some hydrangeas um, here but then it was a, a, a sea of low grass the penicetums which also out front and then poppies and orlea and alliums all very low growing and um, very flowery and totally connects you to the feeling of the fields and the meadows mm. beyond, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, yeah, it really has like a wildflower feel to it. It does, yeah. mm -hmm. totally. Um, and then over here, we planted like a stewardia because we thought that from the dining room, it, uh, having a little height, privacy from the driveway and a place for birds to land and sort of um, feel like you're sort of tucked into this corner. There's also a magnolia kind of for the similar purpose of sort of blocking the the driveway and also creating a little privacy on this side and habitats for birds you know like places for the birds to land that you can enjoy them from inside the house that seems really important um, you'll see that the lictrum is a plant that kind of carries everywhere and it's our very tall meadow rue that uh, is see-through so you get the height the waviness in the wind and you see right through it so you can see out to the the field and the pond on the other side. And you get the most beautiful little purple flower with a little yellow center. Center. It's it's a gorgeous, gorgeous flower. So reseeding annuals is a big part of this this garden. You, um, we've periodically will bring in new rounds of them, but you know, foxgloves, these are all seedlings at this point. I we didn't plant any of those. And then poppies, uh, I think in the first couple of years we planted a few trays of poppies early on and this year we planted no poppies so the seedlings have perpetuated um, this is a really good place for them to do their thing because we don't mess with the soil all that much um, and the the perennials that take over after it's done just leave enough room for them to in the springtime so it's like they have a lot of room in the spring to do their thing they kind of die back and the grasses take over Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a true 
um, succession. Right. This is a beautiful Ito peony. It's called Border Charm. Quite it's lovely. fun to garden with Rita because she loves strong color. So she always is saying, I want more orange. I don't think there's anyone I've ever gardened with that wants more orange. So I'm thrilled, like more mm -hmm. orange. Okay. More orange, yes. So mm -hmm. the, the orangier, the better. Mm -hmm. Rita's color sense and style is, is very inspiring and uh, very motivating in this garden. Thank you. Look at the, the beautiful sea of poppies and orlea, which is breathtaking morning, afternoon, evening. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. It makes you want to just sit out here and stare at it. And when the, when the breeze comes through and it flows, it's, it's really something. And then over here we have some African daisies, which again brings in the orange. And they've got this uh, this interesting sort of waxy texture that I think is it's it's unusual. I haven't seen that on other plants. Yes. Yeah. And there's my uh, any good my orange plant must be trialed here. And the Chirianthes alonii, mm -hmm. that's another orange um, fragrant spring flower. And so these two ponds are connected. These are natural ponds, no, no chemicals or anything. They're just filtered through the plants and um, requires a little bit of maintenance, but not too much. Mostly editing out some of the plants that, you know, that, that start to, to thrive. Mm -hmm. um, and then the idea being that we wanted it to just have a natural look to the, to the pool and sort of set the pool a little bit more in, in this field. You and Tom, having lived in Alaska, mm -hmm. wanting to bring that water element up to the, the hay field, the mm -hmm. top of the, you know, so you have bringing the water and the sound of the water. I think that like that sound of the water where it cascades down to the, the lower pool is really important, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a really lovely, um, it is, it's a really nice, Nice to, to hear that, nice to see the water just freezes in the winter time. So it just, again, it adds more, like a little more texture to the garden at all times. And it's a lovely place to come out and sit. And habitat, I would say too. And habitat, exactly, yeah. There's, you know, of course, frogs, all kinds of different birds that come and yeah. yeah. I would say that the biodiversity of, of the garden is really important. It's almost like <clears throat> obvious, and we don't, but we don't, we don't use any chemicals, so um, we're organic by all intents and purpose. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't even say we're organic because a lot of people would, would use organic sprays. We basically use we nothing. We don't. Yeah, we put down what we do manure, and yeah, that's about it. That's about yeah. it. Manure, manure and water. Really good soil, good mm -hmm. compost, and yep. lots of water. Yep. Mm -hmm. And just if there's p plants or pest bugs, you kind of just let nature run its course. So. Like we had problems with lily beetles. We seem to not have problems anymore. We've done almost nothing except mm -hmm. hand pick bugs occasionally. We hand pick caterpillars if they're getting out of control. But I think that, that you're having flowers all season, you're just always providing habitat and food for insects, butterflies, bees, birds. And even just watering the garden seems important because by watering all this food source for them, you're providing, just like when the place goes dry, like the gardens are still there for all the for all mm -hmm. the bugs, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, that seems really important. Somebody 
asked me about this garden the other day and they were like, are there any natives? And I actually went and looked. We have a ton of native plants in the mix. So there's mm -hmm. like a very sort of tropical feeling and very floriferous and lots of plants that are non-native that are really showy, but we have tons of native plants in the mix, mm -hmm. um, including this bog cranberry. Um, and it just perpetuates along the edge of this, the pond kind of as an understory plant and um, fruits and it's beautiful and spreads and it's very happy kind of living underneath all of these mm -hmm. other plants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, other natives are like this Asclepius um, tuberosa, it's a, a US native anyway, I don't know about New England. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have Joe Pies that sort of seed around everywhere. Lots of Joe Pies. Lots right. of Joe mm -hmm. Pies. Um, the elderberry that seeded in probably on some um, fill. We have no idea where it came from, but we've just let it be. We may move it, but um, and flocks and bee bombs and uh, panicums. These are all sort of U.S. natives and, and New England uh, natives too. So, what's this flower here? This is Lychnis chalcedonica, the Maltese cross, uh, and that is just a beautiful red flower. That it's gorgeous. I yeah. think of this garden as the red purple garden. Red, orange, purple. Mm -hmm. Yep. And here's the verbena that this has been, this is just, it's a, comes back every year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It seeds around. Some of them are perennial periodically. Oh yeah. And so the self seeding also, this is Bupleurum uh, eye. We planted it one year and now it's kind of just mingling everywhere. Um, more garas, poppies. We've put dahlias up in this garden too. So this one is just a nice red dahlia. I don't know the name of it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and the zinnias and the, the great dixter tall marigold cinnabar. So beautiful, yeah. It's kind of a orange red feature. And then you see the thelictrum. And then the thelictrum, which is kind of all around us. Mm -hmm. And it may have too much of a presence this year, but it is. It is gorgeous. We're gonna let it all flower and then we'll make a decision. Yeah. <laughs> This, and this is the elderberry? That's the elderberry that just came in as a seeding seedling. And so it's massive. It may be too big for this spot, but I think we all have that sort of philosophy that we're gardening with the natural processes. So things show up, we work with it. Things die, we work with it. It's just, mm -hmm. it's kind of an ebb and flow. Every season feels really different up here, I think. Mm -hmm. Other interesting plants, um, Centranthemum, pineapple syncria, smells like pineapple, it's purple little sort of mum-like flower. And then this Kufia ignea, um, which is a uh, fat face flower or cigar plant or something like that. But it's, mm -hmm. those are sort of uh, the orange, red, purple. So on this side, it's a more of a shade garden here. And we've got some really beautiful, I always mispronounce it, hellebores. Hellebores. Yeah. Hellebores. They're, um, here, there's a few more over on the, in this area. Some um, ferns, there's this, uh, Asparagus. Mm -hmm. And then what's the, the big, huge Ast Jurassic Park looking? Astilboides tabularis or something. And Karingashoma, that's that big palm leaf. Uh, this one here. The yellow yeah. wax bells, yeah. Right, yellow wax bells. This one, yeah, the flowers on this one is just are really beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. This sure. pot here is made by a local artist, Steve Proctor. And um, it stays out here all year long, and it looks beautiful when it, when it's stark, and then the snow comes in, and it gets partially covered. It looks glorious in the springtime when there's not a lot around it. So you really get to see the whole structure of the pot, mm -hmm. and then this time of year where it's tucked in, and mm -hmm. um, I feel really fortunate to to be able to have that out here and to see it year round. And right now, that blue allium, that little blue globe, is. Allium azurium, so that's sort of it's just a blue allium. It's so beautiful, and it's blooming with the coral zinnia and the chartreuse of the bupleurum that's sort of self-seeded all around, and then the, your lychnis, um, the bright red. So that's so pretty. Actually, yeah. so one plant I want to point out is the indigo fera that's here against the um, the north side of the pool, and that plant didn't. We used I used the plant used to be on this side of the stone wall, and for years, it really did nothing. And finally, we decided to move it, put it over here, and it has taken off. And um, it's one of my favorite plants. We've divided it. We've added it to other parts of the garden. 
we've given some of it away and um, it's yeah it's it's very pretty and what one of the things I love about it is when the blossoms come they they come at the same time typically as the wisteria here and so you have this beautiful uh, pink blossoms there and then the the purple of the wisteria at the same time and it just makes me happy yeah, yeah. and then Helen and Lori planted um, it's an allium and I can't remember the name of it drumstick the drumstick allium which has the beautiful the really pretty reddish cone and that pops up through the uh, the indigo ferra and every time I look at that I think this little garden should be it should be everywhere it's so pretty. Yeah, yeah, it's really pretty. Mm -hmm. That's been really successful. And that was just a whim. We had this plant kind of suffering on the back side of the wall. Mm -hmm. We knew we needed to soften the, the stone of the pool. And so the plant's actually planted right at the edge, but comes out a foot or so. So it just like softens the edge. It loves the heat of the stone. It, uh, when you're in the pool and you can look up into the flowers dangling down at you. I mean, it's one of those kind of like most serendipitous things like I never would have found that plant it's hard to get right. Rita already had it right and I actually um, ordered it from a nursery in North Carolina mm -hmm. I ordered 12 of them I think eight survived the first year mm -hmm. and then kept surviving but not thriving and then when we moved them over here they completely took off and now we've got enough to divide yeah and that's more of the gara the, um, that we've talked about that before we have up front the mm -hmm. bride and it seeds around it's definitely a feature of the fire pit garden which um uh is pretty wonderful uh rita and tom wanted a, a no mow lawn area so it's not even close to a lawn but you definitely don't mow it you and we don't, don't do that much maintenance in there either it's it's a lot of again never had compost never had any water ever and it's thyme and carex and amsonia brisa gara calendula, um, fescues, all these things that like it kind of hot, dry, and to be a little bit ignored. Mm -hmm. So, Although I do water it. You do water it? I do water it. Oh, well, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when I'm like. out with my with the hose, I usually give it a, a little drink. A little bit of a drink. Okay. Yeah. I'm thinking that this, um, this sort of rock formation is right now one of her favorite spots with the foxgloves and this bright grass, which is Milium fusum aureum. And that's when we started from seed and it looked like nothing, remember, early on, and now it's just And like, now it's this, it's just so glorious, right? Yeah, yeah just this. And the light is always kind of coming in and catching it horizontally somehow because it never gets overhead. You know, it's like always, you're always seeing through those grass heads. Um, and then this view to the pool is so um, beautiful. I remember trying to make it a garden and, and Rita was like, no, no, put the grass back. We need a grass path. I was like, okay, like that. I love that. It's a great place for dogs to sit and watch while watch you while you swim. Watch over you while you swim. <laughs> right. It's so sweet, uh -huh. and it's exactly yeah. how you want to get to the pool. It you is don't, exactly how you, you want to get to the pool. You don't want to go that way. No, you don't want to, that. You naturally don't. You want to naturally walk this way. Right. Yeah. Um, the wisteria has. Um, it is. I, I'm just learning how to prune the wisteria to get it to blossom, and I feel like I've finally reached a point where, I've, I've got. I've. I've arrived and it um, it requires pruning twice a year and it's it also you know needs to be unwound and stretched out and my goal is to have it initial and eventually to cover the entire pergola so that it can be shaded when we're out in the in the during the daytime but I give Rita full credit for the wisteria I didn't think wisteria bloomed in Vermont particularly so Rita got determined and she did all the research and did all the work and now it blooms every year and it's year. amazing. Yeah, we're just past the blooms, but you can see how they're they're still on the they're still on the tree, on the vine. The lilies hanging over the wall, this was sort of like what do we do here? We took the indigo ferret out. Anything on the planted low you wouldn't see, but you don't want to block the view. So we took a whim and um, on a whim bought these lilies lectinii and they've just totally spread but they hang their orange um they, they hang in big bells and they are um orange and the butterflies the swallowtail butterflies swarm them maybe mm -hmm. you can come back in a week or two and they'll be they are incredible and so you can they just hang over the wall and it's just like 
dreaming. Yeah. And you have a um, you have a video on your Instagram. I do. That shows the butterflies, and it's yeah, it's magical. There. This garden's probably changed the least, right? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, the flocks and the smoke bush, the peonies, geranium was all here and the front edge, these salvias, these beautiful purple nemorosa salvias were all here. Sedums, daylilies. We added the lilacs to give structure. Also, we needed to move them from when we put on the, you put on the sun porch. We, mm -hmm. we needed a place to put them and so we thought some more anchoring shrubs in this garden would be good and that has been pretty successful. It's the, mis it's the Tinkerbell lilac. Mm -hmm. um, the valerian was here, was that here? I think it, yeah, I think it was here. So that tall white plant is valerian um, and it's very fragrant and beautiful this time of year. It's a little weedy, so it definitely needs to be sort of managed. We have to weed out more than half of it every year. This year it's having a fabulous display. It gives great height there. Um, we've added all the annuals, the salvias and the that pink dianthus, the calendula, the penstemons we've added over the years. Um, the yarrow is here, it's sort of a wild yarrow, millifolium, and it's beautiful even as a ground cover. So after the after it goes brown, we just cut it and it's just a carpet of that ferny foliage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this is usually a pretty colorful, very colorful garden. So in the fall, the zinnias come up. Um, there's a lot of zinnias and Often there's the big castor beans and yeah, not just yeah. here. Mm -hmm. Anything yeah, else? This is sort of like the, um, it's very pretty and it doesn't, I don't think it gets the, uh, I don't want to say it doesn't get the attention it deserves, but it's like, you know, you're rarely do you walk over this way, right? So mostly mm -hmm. you are looking at it from this side, but when you do walk around, it's like, it's a, it's a nice surprise. Yeah. yeah. Uh, whenever I take a picture of this border and I think, oh, this is so pretty, whenever I look at the picture, all I notice is the view. It's so funny. It's like I focus on the photos, but then I actually realize that this just sets off the backdrop. It's like even the shrubs sort of mimic the, shrub, the hill shapes. And so it seems just like a jumping off place or like a, it frames the view somehow. It leads your eye this way, um, sets off the view in a really nice way. So. Um, I always find that I get I zero in on the flowers, and then I look up and think, oh. "Yeah, it's, it's all part of the bigger, yeah, the big part of the bigger picture." Right? It's really mm -hmm. wonderful. So here we've got the lilies, and then the allium that's planted. Um, that's mixed in with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then over here is one of my favorite parts of the garden. It's, is the, um, the fire pit garden, and it's got this beautiful Amsonia, mm -hmm. um, which, yeah, it's, 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 it's such a gorgeous flower. Um, and what I like about this, like as Helen mentioned, it's, it's very drought tolerant, mm -hmm. and it's, um, it's, it's got some more of the Lagara here. Mm -hmm. And then this, what, what, what's this grass here? Blue fescue. Blue fescue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Blue fescue. And I would just say one thing that's been really interesting about working here is that like the Samsonia blue ice was planted at the front of the pergola, but it didn't quite get enough sun. So it didn't bloom. And so we moved that as well as all that geranium on the backside from that garden, from the pergola bed. Um, <laughs> And here it's really flourished. You know, it's like, just like reimagining if plants aren't working in a certain area, just like trying to give them more of what they want or experimenting, maybe it would have been a flop, but it was very successful. And mm -hmm. um, I like how in this garden, all the pathways, we let so many plants seed themselves in so that you're sort of walking through the garden, in the garden, amongst the plants. Um, that's definitely like a, an, a, an ethos aesthetic that we, really learned from Great Dixter. We both spent some time at Great Dixter volunteering in that garden. And to experience the garden, you're kind of experiencing the plantings. And to brush past, to have to move a plant aside so you can get through is a very intimate way to sort of 
be in the garden and feel the garden. And so we're, we definitely are trying to do that here where like you saw Rita trying to walk through the, the pathway to the fire pit. You have to sort of walk through the plants and that's a beautiful experience. I mean, everyone loves walking through a meadow. So um, letting the plants kind of be where they want and navigating through them is, is part of part of the experience and aesthetic, definitely. Yeah, and I would also add that, you know, there's, I don't have a watering system. Uh -huh. And so watering is another way to really get to know your garden. Like mm -hmm. just to stand out there and to, you know, just, just admire uh, it, admire it while you're, while you're watering and watering you see things in a different, in a different way. If I had a watering system, I would miss so much yeah. mm -hmm. of what's happening day to day. Mm -hmm. um, this this is, other plant yeah. that's very interesting that's and rare is the, the toothbrush plant, sort of a vertical grass called Budalea gracilis, and I grew it on a whim, never knowing what it would do. And it, we planted it up here and it sort of leapt down into the cracks and it's, it's totally beautiful and it's so unusual. We came in after all this, everything was built and it was sort of a blank slate. So I felt like it was our job to soften all these different elements with plants. And I think that that's been the goal and, you know, and that it's a combination of planning things and also letting things happen. The advice I give a beginner is be adventurous. Yeah. And pack your garden full of plants and just try things because I feel like there's sort of a snowball effect. Like once you know that one thing was great, then you can try that again and then add the next element. So like <clears throat> the more you learn, the more you try, the more you learn, like, oh, buy something you've never seen before or never heard of. Like, I think people get sort of paralyzed by like, my God, I don't know what this plant is. Just if it looks good or if the picture looks good, the description is particularly captivating, like just buy it, try it, give it some love and it'll probably be great. Or it'll be a flop, but it'll be like one flop of... And I guess the other thing I would say is that I don't particularly like like empty space in a garden. Some people do. And so you have to know your aesthetic. Um, and I don't think, Re I think Rita's, I think our aesthetics are all kind of aligned that we want it full and floriferous and just in succession so that there's the something happening. Is, I think the succession is really important. I love to look out at my garden and see color all seasons and see like the, again, like the structure, like some of the structural plants that I don't necessarily notice, but they give the garden some, some depth and some texture and that continues throughout the season. That's that the, goal. Is the goal. Yeah, right? you want to have something happening all the time. So. One of the great things about gardening with Helen and Lori is that we get to oftentimes do this, where we sit, we have coffee, we talk about all the things that are happening in our lives, and we talk about the garden. And this is where a lot of our ideas start to take shape. It's where a lot of our ideas um, become stronger, mm -hmm. and it's one of the one of my one of the favorite one of my favorite things about. Um, about gardening with Helen and Lori. Yeah. Just getting to spend time together with them like this. Yeah, it's like friendship and plants and gardening and work. It's all all together. In and the good mix. food. It's all tied good together. Food. Yeah. It's like a really special collaboration here mm -hmm. in this garden. Yeah, definitely a collaboration. Mm -hmm. So thank you for visiting with us.